No, I'm not Muslim myself. I'm a Christian. Christian, yeah, Christian Arab. Christian uh, Arab. There's yes, not a lot of those anymore. Yes. <laughs> My family is an old Jerusalemite family from Jerusalem. When trouble started, 47, 48, uh, they uh, left uh, Palestine mm -hmm. um, after the uh, Deir Yassin massacre, in which uh, Jewish militias attacked Palestinian villagers. Now. My family, they weren't villagers, they were living in Jerusalem itself. Mm. But there was a widespread fear and panic. And then in 1950, Israel passed what's known as the absentee property law. And they, they took that, uh, that home. There is a very big local mm. indigenous population uh, in Jordan. So mm -hmm. to say that Jordan is a Palestinian state would be kind of, I mean, would cause offense to those people. Mm -hmm. Palestine was not an independent state. Right? Yeah. Neither was uh, Jordan. What's going on everyone today? I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Marwin Hanania, a Middle Eastern historian at Santa Clara University. Today we're going to talk about his family's experience as refugees from 1948 British Mandate Palestine to Jordan. We're going to break down the perspectives in the Israeli-Palestine conflict, address internet myths and maliciousness, and talk about a roadmap to a peaceful future. Now if you support open discourse on topics like this without the nonsense, please drop a like, subscribe, share this video with a friend. And without further ado, let's get into the interview. Thank you, Ken, for having me. It's yeah. uh, good to talk to talk with you. Thank you. So uh, I teach uh, world history and mm -hmm. Middle Eastern history. And uh, currently I teach at Santa Clara University. Mm -hmm. And occasionally I teach with the Stanford Continuing Studies program. I'm uh, Jordanian-American, but originally of uh, Palestinian and Iraqi origin. Mm. My father is Palestinian. Mother is Iraqi, and I've been uh, teaching in the U.S. Uh, for a long time now. And uh, I also studied here, uh, did my undergraduate uh, work at Cornell in government, and, mm. and my graduate work at Harvard and Stanford in uh, Middle Eastern Studies and History. So you're a pro for real. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that uh, so much, but uh, but I'm uh, I'm happy to be here, and uh, yeah. I think. Uh, uh, I'm enjoying it. Thank you. We're gonna have some fun. Yeah. So you're a friend of Dr. Dworkin. He yes. studies nationalism as his focus in European history. Yes. You focus on Middle Eastern history and world history. Yes. Is there a certain time period that you focus on? So with my research, it's mostly 19th and 20th century. So recent centuries. Yeah. Cool. Um, but with my teaching. It really depends what the universities want me to teach. So mm -hmm. currently I've been teaching a lot of Islamic history courses that start, you know, in the uh, immediate pre-Islamic uh, environment of Arabia. So and 500s. Yeah, 500s, 600s. Then we get to 622 with the Hijra or migration of the Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to mm -hmm. Medina. And then I go through the various caliphs and empires and I take it all the way to the present. So I've been doing a lot of that. Uh, in my teaching, I'm more flexible in terms of the time range I can look at. Mm. And research is more, more modern time periods. So it's a history of the religion. Are you a historian on the religion itself or just so a history? So it's more, uh, those courses are more uh, about the history of Islamic civilization. Okay. Uh, some of it is in theology, but most of it uh, is in the field of history. Mm -hmm. So we kind of uh, identify the influences on Islam, uh, you know, Judaism, Christianity, the polytheistic environment in Arabia. Mm -hmm. And then I get to the actual historical narratives, uh, and, you know. But you're not Islamic. No, I'm not Muslim myself. I'm a Christian. Christian, yeah, Christian Arab. Christian uh, Arab. There's yes, not a lot of those anymore. Yes. <laughs> well, there used to be a lot more living in the Middle East. Now most of the Christian Arabs have uh, migrated, and of course the numbers as percentages have mm -hmm. gone down. And is that something you talk about in your courses? Oh, of course, yeah. Okay. And currently I'm also working on an article about the uh, history of Christianity in the Middle East. You know, sometimes that gets a little bit lost in the narratives about the region. Yeah, like it's just Jews and Muslims, but we forget yes. Christians. It's yes. the same. Yeah. Jesus was Christ or Jesus was a Jew, but Christianity came from Jesus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. So, so, uh, so that part doesn't get discussed a lot, and uh, people sometimes forget that there is a very rich yeah. Christian heritage in the Middle East, and mm -hmm. that Christianity in its inception was a uh, Christian religion, uh, was a Middle Eastern religion, mm -hmm. um, and that uh, you know when people talk about the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. 
sometimes they neglect to mention Islam. Mm -hmm. And actually, the three, uh, these three major monotheistic faiths had a lot of uh, impact on each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I kind of try to bring that out in my first in my uh, teaching but also in my research as well okay so we'll get into that a little bit yeah. but the main reason why i have you here is yeah. because the war in israel is a huge topic it's right. crazy yes tens of thousands of people are dying yeah and if you go on social media and talk about it you're automatically put into a pro-zionist or a almost pro hamas side when there doesn't seem to be any middle ground or people talking to each other about the issue. They just want their side to win and it seems like to just kill the other because their killing is justified. So today we're going to talk about the history of it, how you see it, A, as your personal experience since you're from, your family is from the region of Palestine, they had their house taken, went to Jordan, now you're in America, but then also as your historian perspective of it. Yeah. So let's first go into your personal history. What's your family history like in the region? Um, so family history is, uh, my family is an old Jerusalemite family from Jerusalem. That's freaking cool. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and in fact the name Hanania, or sometimes, you know, Ananias. Mm -hmm. uh, Hanania is a, uh, an old, uh, an old uh, family name. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it comes from, it's uh, uh, in the New Testament and it's also in the Old Testament as well. And uh, we like to joke that there are good Hananias and bad Hananias in the Bible. <laughs> and we think we're from the good Hananias. But, <laughs> but yeah, we have a long history uh, from uh, in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And um, the, farther, the, the farthest we can personally trace, of course, we go a lot uh, farther, but is to um, my dad's uh, great-grandfather, um, so uh, Isa Hanania. It's like early 1900s. Uh, 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 19th century. Oh, so yeah. late 18th, okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, second half of the 19th century. And we do have a picture of the family, uh, maybe I'll send it to you, yeah. from uh, the 1890s. Crazy. And that's, I think, the oldest picture we have. Um, and they, st you know, their descendants, you know, my grandfather, he was a lawyer and politician in uh, Palestine. Mm -hmm. And um, it, in 1948, uh, when trouble started, 47, 48, uh, they uh, left uh, Palestine mm -hmm. um, after the Deir Yassin massacre in which uh, Jewish militias attacked Palestinian villagers. Now, my family, they weren't villagers, they were living in Jerusalem itself. Mm. But there was a widespread fear and panic, and that's why they fled. But when they fled, they thought they would come back. Mm. And they, of course, uh, like many other Palestinians, were not allowed to come back. And then they uh, ended up residing uh, in Jordan, in East Jerusalem, mm. and finally in Jordan. Uh, and my family has been living there ever since. Yeah. My mother's family, are also Christians, but they're Catholic. My father's family is Orthodox. Mm -hmm. So a lot of Arabs, you know, are uh, Arab Christians mostly are Orthodox, but there are yeah. Catholics as well. A lot of Catholics. I can see that because that's the Eastern Europe or the Eastern, Eastern Church and then the yeah. Western Church. Yeah. So my mother's family is Catholic, and they're from uh, Baghdad, but originally they're from Mosul in uh, northern Iraq, mm -hmm. and probably of of Turkish descent, but we're not too sure about that. And they, uh, um, you know, the whole family left uh, Iraq uh, steadily over the years with all the wars there. Um, oh. And uh, so we're kind of, uh, my family lives in Jordan, my, my parents, and Jordan is in, the, in, in between. Yeah. Kind of like a land in the middle. Um, and the city of Amman, which I write a, a lot about in my research, is kind of known as the city, in, uh, I call it the city in the middle. Yeah. And uh, it combines many different ethno-national groups. And they kind of exist in a state of, uh, of uh, harmony, which is unique among Levantine cities. Yeah. Uh, so speaking about cooperation, and I know your research is about that, yeah. you know, Amman's a good model for that. Your guys' house got taken in, you said 1950? 1950. So they left 48. And then in uh, 1950, uh, Israel passed what's known as the absentee, uh, the absentee property law uh, of 1950. And they, they took that, uh, that home. And uh, 
you know, uh, this is a painful part of the memory. Not so much for me because mm -hmm. you weren't alive. Uh, I wasn't there, yeah. you know. But for my dad, for my, his sisters, for my late grandparents, it, it was a painful, painful thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so that home was in West Jerusalem. Okay. And West Jerusalem now does not have uh, any Arabs left, very, very few, if any. And most of the Arabs in Jerusalem, the ones that are left, are on the eastern side. Because mm -hmm. that's where the West Bank is, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So in, in 67, um, from 48 to 67, East Jerusalem was under the Jordanian uh, mm -hmm. government. And then... Uh, the Jordanians lost uh, East Jerusalem, which includes the old city, mm -hmm. and these are considered, uh, you know, occupied territory, yeah. um, and uh, you know, along with the West, the rest of the West Bank, mm -hmm. and then the Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights. And so now we're going to get into a little bit of the history. Yeah. So, you said Jordan had control. Your family went to Jordan during yeah. the 40, after the forty eight war yeah. started. I hear that Jordan was supposed to be the Palestinian state. Uh, how, how would you explain the history of... Uh, no, everything? you see, this is, a, this is a misconception. So Jordan is, uh, there is a very big uh, local mm -hmm. indigenous population uh, in Jordan, what are sometimes called in the literature like uh, East, Eastern Jordanians or East Bank Jordanians or sometimes Transjordanians. Yeah, I've heard that one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably now the most correct term is Eastern Jordanians, not just East Bank, but Eastern Jordanians in general. Um, and those, of course, are native to, to Jordan. So mm -hmm. to say that Jordan is a Palestinian state would be kind of, I mean, would cause offense to those people. Mm -hmm. um, because the land that people, the land of Palestine, that area, that's, it was never also Jordan. It was it's two well, different places. Uh, no, so, so. It's a little bit complex. Administratively, Palestine was not an independent state. Right? Yeah. Neither was uh, Jordan. Um, culturally, of course, you know, in some of the literature, you know, Arabic Muslim uh, literature, they do refer to Palestine as uh, uh, mm -hmm. a distinct land with a culture of its own and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But there were never real borders of a no, land called Palestine. E exactly. Yeah, okay. there weren't those real bo borders. Um, the confusion about Palestine and Jordan is that initially, after World War I, uh, the idea was to have them as part of one uh, mandate, you mm. know? but mm -hmm. then uh, they decided to, uh, you know, the European powers, the British especially, to divide it up. Mm -hmm. So in 1921, the Emirate of Transjordan was created under British supervision. Mm -hmm. with uh, Amir Abdullah, who's a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad from the Hashemite family, mm. taking control of Jordan, and but in a semi-independent fashion, okay. until finally in 1946 it became fully independent and became, of course, as you know, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Mm -hmm. The Palestine mandate, so it was separated from Jordan in 1921, mm -hmm. and, you know, it was created 22, around there that time, and was under the British until, of course, the failure of partition and, you know, the British moved out and the mm -hmm. establishment of Israel and the various wars. Mm -hmm. Do you remember much from your childhood in Jordan growing up? Just tell us about your childhood in Jordan. Childhood was very nice. I mean, uh, you know, obviously I come from a, a, a rather privileged background. Mm -hmm. um, my father was a surgeon and a general in the army, and he became a senator. Damn, and, that's yeah, crazy. So, what so, the so the family was, you know, I mean, in a good position. Yeah, Hanania, it's a, it's a big name. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, in the West, there is a misconception that... Uh, Palestinians in Jordan are, uh, you know, of a secondary status and all that. And mm -hmm. our experience was not like that at all. Um, you know, Palestinians in Jordan were well integrated in many fields. Mm -hmm. Maybe not so much so in the public sector, even though my family was in the public yeah. sector in a big <laughs> way. But Palestinians were more integrated into the private sector than the public sector. And most Palestinians were given citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, especially the ones from, uh, you know, from Palestine proper, you know, or what is now Green Line Israel and the West Bank. Mm -hmm. The Gaza ones, not so much. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but Jordan did welcome 
you know, a okay. huge number of Palestinians, such that today, if you look at the population of Jordan, I mean, this is also not, you know, some subject. It's, it is subject to disagreement a little bit, mm -hmm. but I would say between 50 to 65 percent of the population of Jordan is of Palestinian origin. Mm -hmm. So you said not the Gaza folk. Yeah. Uh, I hear that a lot. People yeah. might accept the Palestinians of the West Bank and everywhere else, but team, is there a problem in Gaza specifically? No, no, it's not that there is a problem specifically, but what happened was um, in 48, the Jordanians decided, you know, Amir Abdullah, um, and then of course uh, King Talal and King Hussein, uh, they decided, uh, King Abdullah, they decided to give the Palestinian citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, and so Gaza wasn't part of that yet because the, the, Egypt. the, yeah, the Palestinians who came uh, to Jordan came mostly from, uh, you know, uh, Haifa, Yaffa, Jerusalem, mm -hmm. uh, parts of the West Bank. Then when the West Bank was under Jordan, 48 to 67, Jordan lost that those Palestinians who moved were also given uh, citizenship. Mm -hmm. Gaza, however, is a different case because it was under, as you correctly said, under Egypt. And so, I mean, some Gazans, you know, maybe who came before, I'm sure there are some Gazan families who got Jordanian citizenship, mm -hmm. but but the bulk uh, did, did not. Is there a difference between someone who's is in Gaza identifying as a Palestinian versus the West Bank? Are there now two different cultures of it, the Gaza uh, culture and the West Bank uh, culture? Not so much, no. Uh, culturally, no. It's it's one people, really. Mm -hmm. um, even with the Palestinians in the 48, the 48 Palestinians, mm -hmm. the ones who stayed, who became eventually citizens of Israel. Mm -hmm. So there's like three groups of Palestinians yeah. in there. There's the West Bank Palestinians, um, there's uh, the Palestinian Israelis, and then you have the Gazans. And culturally, I would say the Gazans and West Bankers are closer to each other than the 48 Palestinians. Mm -hmm. But also, even with the 48 Palestinians, there are a lot. You know, I mean, they are one people originally. Yeah. And, you know, the same food, same... Um, language, uh, language, religion. Exactly. I mean, not so, religion, because it was... Well, the religion, Muslims and Christians, mostly Muslim in all three yeah. areas. Um, what would you say the motivation was for people to either stay in Israel or to go to Jordan? Because I'd imagine that's like a, you know, oh, everyone just left. Who, the people who stayed. Yeah. Why did they stay? Yeah. I mean, in places like Haifa. And, uh, yeah. Well, the thing was, a lot of it was based on, uh, in the first phase, a lot of it was based on um, the ability to leave. Mm. So a lot of the affluent families uh, uh, left early. They had cars. Because, and... because, yeah, they had cars, a means of transportation, uh, so they could get out. The, uh, and then certain events dictated after that mm -hmm. if you leave or not. Some people left at gunpoint. A lot of villages were destroyed, mm. uh, hundreds of villages. And, of course, those people had to leave, otherwise they'd get killed. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, what village was your house in? Because you said it was in West Jerusalem. Yeah, not so a village. For us, we're okay. urban, urban family. So it okay. was in West Jerusalem, and uh, what's known as, what was known then as the Upper Baqa area. Mm -hmm. It was a very classy neighborhood. Uh, but you know my, what my father and 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 aunts recall is that uh, at the time when the uh, the events started, first mm -hmm. there was a Jewish Arab civil war. Mm -hmm. between November 1947 to May 1948. And then there was the Arab-Israeli conflict mm -hmm. from 48, from May 48 onward. Yeah. So a lot of the families around them started leaving. So their neighbors started leaving one by one. And then, you know, they looked around and they were the only ones left in that specific neighborhood. Mm. And so, I mean, maybe there, there were just a few people left. There was an Armenian man left there, and they decided, okay, well, maybe it's dangerous and we have to leave. <laughs> and my yeah. grandfather at the time, you know, had several daughters, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of rumors of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian girls getting raped. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of that fear also. Yeah. Um, and there was fear of, of getting, you know, killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why they left. But when they left, they thought they would come back. They didn't mm -hmm. leave with the idea that they're leaving permanently. Mm -hmm. So how would you explain the conflict from, I guess, 
a pro-Israel side versus the idea of the conflict and the history from a pro-Palestine side, and then if there's just a neutral, here's here's just what happened without trying to play sides. How would you explain? Yeah. The so you know, the way I like to think about it is that. Uh, when we study history, history is not necessarily a composite of narratives. You know, if one side says this and the other side says that, history doesn't mean that it's, it's right in the middle, mm -hmm. right? History, you know, the truth could be closer to one side than the other. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just like a, an aside, like a, yeah. a, a point just to bear in mind. Um, there are differences in perspective. The Palestinians tend to emphasize the Nakba, or what they call the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians believe that, you know, it was unjust, uh, you know, the fact that they lost their homeland. Mm -hmm. And so, so a lot of the Palestinian narrative focuses on that. The Israeli narrative focuses on uh, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Jews had the history of persecution in Europe, mm -hmm. and that they had finally uh, come to a, a place where they could exercise their uh, right to self-determination mm -hmm. and that they were surrounded by hostile neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very different narrative and yeah. both sides see themselves as, as victims. Yeah, and both are true. I mean, yes, your family is a case in point. How You had to leave, couldn't get it back. Other side of the history is, yep, we were getting killed by the millions, yeah, yeah, we left. Europe, so. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so there is uh, definitely, both sides are victims, but in, within this conflict, both of them see themselves as victims. Yeah. So the, the, the Israeli Jews see themselves as, I mean, I'm not going to speak for all of them, mm -hmm. and I can't speak for all Palestinians or Jordanians for that matter, but both sides see themselves as victims of the other, and this mm -hmm. is one of the problems. And both, because if you see yourself as a victim, both are fighting for their liberation from yes. the oppressed and the enemy. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's why it makes it very hard for people to hear each other. And this has been, of course, uh, made worse since uh, the events of October 7th. Since mm -hmm. then, uh, it's very hard uh, to get anybody to talk. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I know you started off by saying, uh, you know, social media, how, how hard it is to follow. And I agree with you on that because on social media people are angry. Yeah. They're, they're, going, they're going at each other. Yeah. Uh, of course, there is there is some justification for the uh, the anger, but going mm -hmm. after somebody uh, in a virtual setting like that doesn't really solve much. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, making people aware of what's going on is important, but not uh, just arguing back and forth. It becomes kind of like a, f a form of uh, scoring points. Yeah, and and just it, continuing the art. The drama's over there, but we're going to put it online and make it everywhere. Yeah. And everyone's going to get just caught into the drama. Yeah, so. yeah. And uh, that's maybe not the most constructive uh, thing to do. <laughs> um, but going back to your question, so we, we said the two narratives, and then what, what has happened? What has happened is that, you know, essentially this conflict is... Uh, conflict of clashing nationalisms. You yes. have two national groups uh, who are claiming the same territory, the same piece of land, um, and uh, it has become very difficult to resolve. It has led to numerous conflicts mm -hmm. over the years, and it seems that there is uh, no end in sight. Mm -hmm. And uh, one very obvious conclusion from everything we've se we're seeing is that there is no, neither side has a military option or there is no military solution to this conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, How would you say that is? So, um, all right, so the Israelis cannot uh, d uh, defeat the Palestinians in the sense that they cannot uh, uh, get rid of or eliminate the whole idea of Palestinian nationalism mm -hmm. uh, and the, the striving of many Palestinians mm -hmm. or Palestinians for independence. Which is a very interesting point because I see right now the, the focus is destroy Hamas and the terrorist groups that will, will do another October 7th. 
not necessarily all Palestinians. However, I could see that being something where people do get lost up in if they generalize the atrocities of Hamas with just all Palestinians of this this is who we represent or who represents you, so just get rid of all of you. But that's not I wouldn't say that's the case for everybody, but with I guess Hamas if we would want to call them a terrorist group, which is kind of hard to do because they're the governing power of Gaza. So what do you say? Technically, Hamas is a military organization? or Hamas would you... is a, in my opinion, a symptom of the conflict. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the short term, you know, a lot of Israelis say, well, October 7th, October 7th, but... But uh, Hamas was not around in the 70s or the 60s. Hamas is a product of a very brutal occupation, especially of Gaza, from 67 to 1987 mm -hmm. when it was formed during the first Palestinian Intifada, during those beginning phases of that Intifada, that revolution. Yeah. So Hamas is a symptom uh, of the occupation. It is a uh, Islamic resistance group. Mm -hmm. A political Islamist group. Specifically following the religion of Islam and not only about Palestinians, but also including Islam as a, as well, a focus. Well, they are, uh, it came out of, uh, of um, a particular way of understanding Islam, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a nationalist resistance movement, not just an Islamist group, mm -hmm. but a nationalist resistance movement. Uh, what's important to understand is that uh, Hamas is, uh, has a lot of uh, reach into the Palestinian society. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it has a military wing. Mm -hmm. So the problem with the Israeli objective is that it's a, an unrealistic objective mm -hmm. to destroy Hamas. It cannot be done militarily. It's like the United States war on terrorism as soon as we defeat another terrorist group, another one's going to pop up because of the defeated terrorist group. Or would you say it's something like that? Um, the, the problem is that if they, I mean, let's say, what do they mean by defeating Hamas? Like killing the commanders or, you know, uh, eliminating its military capability. Mm -hmm. Well, what's going to happen is that in a few years, all these young people who are watching all this death and destruction around them, some of them, Mm -hmm. will uh, become radicalized and will seek uh, revenge. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've seen people radicalized for, I think, a lot. I think the Boston bomber didn't make a wrestling team and thought it was because he was Islamic and then became a terrorist. Like, so... Now that... Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry, so people sorry. do it for a lot worse, but seeing your homes built, blown up and, you know, the Israelis and most of the, you know, my perspective is, well, you had it coming in a sense, but they don't have that perspective. To them, yeah. they're still the victim, the oppressed, and yeah. that's why the violence is gonna continue. Both sides see it as justifiable. Yes. One thing I would say, though, that's a little bit different between you know, Hamas and just individual acts of terror uh, in the US or the West, is that Hamas is responding to uh, an occupation, military occupation. Mm -hmm. It's very violent, very brutal. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true the Israelis pulled out the settlements from the from Gaza, but they probably they pretty much enclosed it in an air. Uh, and we are open air prison. Open is the air term prison. They say. Yeah, exactly. Um, so so then Hamas responds to that. Um, and how would you say is uh, is it really an open air prison? What what makes it that? And then yeah. is that is some of that exaggerated? No. Okay. Uh, I, my belief is that no, it's not exaggerated. The conditions there were very bad, uh, even before you know, um, 2005, 2006, when things started getting worse. But even before that, I mean, Gaza has always been, uh, you know, part, uh, there's, a, there's work by the scholar Sarah Roy, who is a Jewish American scholar, and I believe uh, from a Holocaust survivor family, she did mm -hmm. a lot of uh, research on Gaza, and she coined the term de-development. Mm. Like the Israeli approach to Gaza was very harsh in terms of like uh, economic development, uh, political uh, oppression. Uh, so Gaza has always been uh, a particularly problematic as yeah. a place for the Israelis. More than the West Bank. More so than the West Bank, yes, correct. Yeah. More so. Uh, 
and uh, th that's a factor to bear in mind you know when you when when people say you know Hamas is a terrorist group all that certainly individual actions that they, they have taken you know to me as a pacifist are not acceptable mm -hmm. you know I don't believe in a military strategy to this conflict mm -hmm. um, I believe what ends up happening unfortunately is that they it's true that they you know by doing what they did on October 7th, they've brought back a lot of attention to the issue. But at the same time, they pushed the Israelis more. Because the right. the, just like the Palestinians who see their house getting bombed, now they're justified. Well, now there's a whole new reason yes. of justification. Yes, so. yes exactly. And, uh, so it's kind of this cycle. And also the, uh, the other unfortunate part was that some of the people in the southern part of Israel tended to be more liberal. Mm. And maybe more amenable to compromise mm -hmm. um, and that's an unfortunate part of the story as well mm -hmm. yeah. and so we've got the history both sides see themselves as oppressed fighting the oppressor i guess first let's go into how has israel been oppressive as we're saying what what were the actions we saw that got you guys' house took in because you weren't from, there? From uh, which uh, years? Uh, I guess, let's say from the start and ha let's say from the start of the conflicts to, I guess, to now. Let's, yeah, let's go through the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. So the one thing was the uh, expropriation of the homes and the destruction of hundreds of Palestinian villages. Mm -hmm. uh, by destruction, I mean complete. Sometimes you see uh, certain remnants of villages and they've even planted trees to cover mm. those remnants, you know. So, so if I hear someone who says, name one Palestinian village that was taken, you can't... Well, yeah, there are what? hundreds of them, and they are all documented in, uh, well, many places. There's uh, a Salman Abu Sitta, mm -hmm. a Palestinian historian, documented all the places. There's also in English, Walid Khalidi, mm -hmm. a very uh, prominent scholar who was mm -hmm. at Harvard for a long time. Um, you know, documenting village by village and where they were and their... So, so it's... Historically, it's not a disputable fact mm -hmm. that they destroyed villages. A part of it was... Uh, uh, sorry, part oh. of it was deliberate. Mm -hmm. And part of it was uh, within the scope of military operations. Mm -hmm. And there's a long debate about, uh, you know, the origins of the Palestinian refugee problem. Yeah. Was it by design or not? And this is a question that's taken up by the Israeli new historians, like uh, Benny Morris, uh, Ilan Pape, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some of the Palestinian ones as well, Noor Masalha, I mentioned Walid Khalidi, Rashid Khalidi as well. Mm -hmm. So that those two things are very big, the depopulation and uh, housing and villages. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, and of course, a lot of massacres uh, along the way. Because we hear people say October 7th, you know, the mass, you know, 1,400 people dead, uh, estimate. They, uh, I hear a lot, that's what the Palestinians have li been living through, through 48. How yeah. much of that is an exaggeration and how much no, is... No, uh, it's, uh, it is correct. Uh, there were uh, many massacres. Uh, for example, you know, the Deir Yassin massacre, the Sabra and Shatila massacre in Lebanon, when the Israeli army allowed the Christian Falange Lebanese to go in and, and uh, basically massacre people in the camp. So there are many massacres over time. There's also the town of Qibya. Uh, uh, th there are many massacres in Palestine, Jordan, and mm -hmm. Lebanon. Um, that's another element. But I believe the worst uh, you know, problem has been since 67, okay. which is the military occupation of the West Bank. Gaza and uh, uh, Jerusalem, uh, East Jerusalem. The reason being that occupation involves, uh, you know, abducting people, putting them in prisons, a lot of torture, mm. uh, transferring people from the territory of the occupation to the territory of the occupier. Sometimes their families don't know where they are. Mm. Uh, atrocious conditions, a lot of people killed on a daily basis through snipers, through, mm. uh, you know, military uh, vehicles going in and out, um, and just not allowing a regular society and economy to develop. Mm -hmm. And this is what led to the radicalization that we see. Mm. Um, so, so those are the things. I mean, there are, there's also the question of settlements, mm -hmm. resource distribution, 
uh, land, taking land, uh, taking water. So it is a very highly oppressive situation that was bound to lead to, uh, uh, you know, something like October 7. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, as I tell people, to explain is not to justify. Exactly, and that's so, the big point I wanted to hit on. Yeah. You're explaining how the Palestinian perspective has bred these groups to feel justified in their violence. Or the Palestinian experience. Yes, but you yourself are not saying this is, like, like we will hear on social media, because of these things, it is good that the Palestinians are having this violent resistance. But you'd yeah. say, no, no, it's not, it's not no, helping. No, it's not helping. And in fact, uh, historically, if we look at the Palestinian case, mm -hmm. uh, the violent resistance has not worked, in my opinion. It's uh, still going. Yeah, so it's, it's, <laughs> so, not, it's not something that has worked. Mm -hmm. Now, I do support things like, uh, you know, yeah, uh, protests, uh, demonstrations, uh, oh, yeah. civil disobedience, uh, things of that. Nature. Like how Mark, uh, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting her name, sat on the back of the bus or sat on the front. Th Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. Yeah. Gosh, what did I think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So things like that. Now it's not that they haven't been tried. There's mm -hmm. been a lot of that going on. Sometimes with the Israelis participating also. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes with people from outside. Um, and the response is, is, you know, often very harsh. But uh, the, the military aspect, the problem with it is that the, uh, it's difficult to get uh, Israelis to be on your side when that military action is taking place. Mm -hmm. So the way this is going to get solved, you know, in an ideal world, is that uh, there has to be a coalition built Mm -hmm. between Palestinians and, and moderate Israelis. And what I heard from Dr. Dworkin, yes. the reason how the, how the Irish problem was solved, yeah. and which is crazy to me. And he's an expert on, on Ireland. Right. Yeah. So within those, those three decades, 30 years, 3,000 yeah. people died, and to the Irish people, that was enough, which allowed people in the middle to get together and third-party mediators yes. to help end it. But... For this three de or three generation problem, we see tens of thousands, but we don't see people saying violence is enough. And so to me, yes. what my next book is gonna be on, it's the struggle of when is violence actually acceptable, mm -hmm. which is the whole debate in pacifism. pacifism. Right, right. So, right. I mean, you know, people with regard to the Palestinian issue, they've given uh, examples comparable cases like, for example, the Vietnamese Tet Offensive or the uh, various slave revolts, you know, uh, mm. the U.S. Uh, uh, so, so those are like comparable examples. And I even hear people say it would be the same if the Native Americans did that. But I'm like, well, not really, because they don't. It'd be insane if they did that. <laughs> They would, well, I mean, there was a resistance in the beginning, but yeah. they, were, they were they were killed. Yeah. Um, and that's, of course, every case, you know, as any good historian should say, every case is different. Yeah. Uh, the problem with Israel-Palestine is that um, um, both sides have uh, a powerful, uh, uh, you know, powerful reasons for wanting to, to stay there, wanting to um, mm -hmm. emerge uh, victorious. Uh, for the Palestinians, I mean, I think right now it's just a struggle for independence and mm -hmm. freedom. And so I'd imagine the two-state solution versus a one-state solution, yeah. which when I hear people say one state, I feel like people assume a complete dominance of one or the other, not necessarily both having one state, but just like in the Irish problem, a Palestinian representation and an Israeli representation yeah. have to come to a compromise for there to be any kind of movement forward. Yeah. How do you see a two-state solution of Israel and Palestine as two actual different states or a one-state solution of how I just described it? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, if it's a two-state solution, mm -hmm. the Palestinian state has to be a viable state. Not just a little strip here separated with West Bank and there's no connection. Yes. I think if it is a legitimate state, uh, you know, then then that m may work. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, people say that uh, with so many settlements now built in the West Bank, it would be very difficult. But then there's the idea of a land swap mm. of 
keeping some of the settlements and then giving the Palestinians land from Green Line Israel, mm -hmm. from inside the Green Line. Uh, and that's been, you know, some Israeli uh, politicians have talked about it and mm -hmm. some Palestinian politicians have talked about it. Then the one state would be a democratic state, but I think for that to work, uh, it would be, of course, one person, one vote, but at the same time, maybe having some sort of structures mm. that uh, would uh, allow both peoples to feel secure. Yeah. Because the problem with just a one state is that it uh, runs against the whole idea of Zionism. Because it can't uh, be a Jewish state because they want to have... It will be a Jewish state, yeah. yeah exactly. Because they probably will not be a majority. Mm -hmm. uh, so then the idea is probably what... I mean, I haven't talked to Dr. Dworkin about it, but probably mm -hmm. in a long time. But probably what he's saying is, maybe there could be an idea where you have like, a, you know, one state but two parliaments or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. So the majority can't oppress the minority. Exactly. Yeah. So that the, the rules uh, and in this case, you know, the majority minority are close in number, mm -hmm. and then you know, uh, y you want to make sure that they are protected. Uh, Adequately, yeah. So what would we say the problem is with Jewish nationalism, Zionism, and the problem with the Palestinian nationalism? Yeah. Or it's not, would you say there's not really a problem for either's, either national movement? The problem is you can't compromise and actually just fucking get along. Yeah. So the big problem, you know, was the Jewish nationalism or Zionism. Um, when it was conceived, you know, it's a late 19th century idea, mm -hmm. um, which was common at the time. People were, you know, they had moved from the idea of being subjects in empires, mm -hmm. you know, over time, mm -hmm. to being uh, c citizens. And mm -hmm. there was the idea of a nation state, all of that was, was being, uh, uh, was a prevalent idea in Europe. Mm -hmm. So the idea of Zionism, initially, it wasn't necessarily uh, linked to uh, Palestine specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, like for example, uh, Leo Pinsker, who was one of the leading Zionist thinkers of the 19th century, he wrote a book, Auto Emancipation, and he said, well, you know, uh, it, it, it doesn't have to be yeah. Palestine. And they had different ideas, you know, Herzl as well later on, you mm -hmm. know, he, he wrote about different ideas, maybe in Africa, maybe South America. The problem with Zionism, from a Palestinian perspective, is that it's a form of uh, settler colonialism mm -hmm. because um, they targeted a land or an area that was already inhabited with a local population yeah, okay. that was 95% Arab mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the late 19th century. So that, that is the problem from a Palestinian mm -hmm. point of view with Zionism. Palestinians don't have a, a problem with the Jews having their own state. It's just there, and not just because they think that's Arab land specifically, but it's... it's, it's it, 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 you're, they, that's where they were. Yeah. Uh, so that is the problem with Zionism. Uh, now, on the other hand, the Zionists will tell you, well, you know, this is not just a random land. Yeah, exactly. that this is a land where they have heritage and where their ancestry comes from. It's where everything in the Bible is written. Is written. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So there's, there's that. And yeah. that makes it more, even more complicated. But regardless, I mean, getting into, uh, getting into this debate, you know, it, became, it begins to... You kind of begin to lose the forest for the trees because, you know, we can then begin to talk about, well, who's native and who's not. Yeah. Uh, the Jews, some of them were, uh, you know, had converted to Judaism in Europe. Mm -hmm. Some of them uh, originated, you know, the Ashkenazim, some of them mm -hmm. were converts, some of them uh, originate from the Middle East. And the Sephardim and Mizrahim yeah. originate from the Middle East, um, you know, Sephardim in Spain and, you know, with some... Uh, Middle Eastern ancestry, so it becomes very complicated. And with the Palestinians also, some of them mm -hmm. are obviously pre-Arab and pre-Islamic peoples, and some mm -hmm. of them came a little bit later. So then that also becomes uh, uh, complicated and not really a useful way to think about it because yeah. the fact is that you have millions of people Arabs and Jews living there now. Yep. So getting into these, I mean, I see it online. I know what you're talking about when you, you know, I share your frustration. It's like 
Palestinians, we've been here for 500 years. Yeah, before you took it from us, we were here. Yeah, yeah, that kind <laughs> that of debate is not really useful because yeah. regardless, uh, you know, it doesn't matter because at this point there are millions of people there and there needs to mm -hmm. be an international structure mm -hmm. that is acceptable. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe the international community has to step in yeah. and force a solution on both peoples. Uh, Which that, I feel like most of the world could be supportive of. <laughs> yeah, most of the world is tired of this conflict, wants yeah. to resolve it. Um, well, we'll see. Uh, so what do you think about the idea when people say Israel and people who are living there, it's a, it's a white movement and the white people from Europe came and took the brown people's land. Because yeah. when I hear that, I'm like, well, the man my sister just married, his dad is from Iraq. Yeah. His mom is a Palestinian native. Like, they are brown. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah so, so that, of course, yeah. I mean, I think the reason people say that is because, yes, Zionism is a European settler colonial movement. That doesn't mean that Jews don't have Middle Eastern ancestry. Mm. Uh, you know, their uh, uh, Judaism, as I teach in my Islam classes, is a you know a, a, local, a significant component of Middle Eastern culture, mm -hmm. whether in Iraq or Yemen or Morocco uh, or uh, Israel Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't say that all Jews are white and blonde-eyed and all this and then... <laughs> Which is crazy because yeah. that's exactly who Hitler was trying to extirpate, well, right, well, wanted. Right, right, <laughs> like, right, 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 yeah. What? So, so then, yeah, we get into all these, uh, again, that's why the online stuff is not that helpful. Mm -hmm. We get into all these... Uh, uh, crazy people. Uh, murky waters, <laughs> yeah. yes, and then, uh, and then it doesn't lead to any valuable, uh, you know, Conclusion. What's a path now that we could take? Because, yeah, like, definitely fuck, fuck things happened in the past by the Israeli army and the Zionist movement. And now bad things are happening in response to that. And that. But, okay, what's the step forward? I think the immediate step is that this current conflict uh, needs to end immediately. There needs to be a ceasefire. Uh, that's the first thing from a humanitarian point of view. Mm -hmm. And how, because we hear that there will be no ceasefire unless the hostages were, are released or some. so... Well, there have been some efforts uh, coming forth, uh, you know, with negotiations including uh, Egypt, the US, mm -hmm. Qatar, and including the Israelis and Palestinians uh, to try to expedite the path toward the ceasefire. Uh, there has to be a lot of U.S. pressure levied on Netanyahu, and at the same time, a lot of Arab pressure levied on Hamas. And I feel like that might be a huge problem because every video I would see that is coming out of Gaza of the Gazan people protesting against Hamas, it's like, but then I hear other people say, well, that's not true. No, like I hear, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, it's hard to say now how people feel, and I, I made this point in a, lec like a public lecture I gave a few months ago, uh, and, and now it's even worse. Mm. When there is a war, it's very hard to gauge public opinion mm. well, because people are, are angry, people are afraid, mm. so you don't know exactly the opinion of people. Yeah. Are people in Gaza even allowed to have freedom of speech to protest? Right to now, pr probably not. You yeah. know, right now, the, you know, in the middle of the war, uh, no. But I did see some videos. I did see one video, for example, of a Palestinian man and his family, and they were very angry at mm. Hamas for, you know, starting this mm -hmm. latest round of the conflict. But other Palestinians feel, well, you know, they didn't start it. It was started well long before. So it's hard to say, but I think after this conflict, you know, ends, if it ends soon, uh, I think you're going to see a significant improvement. Hmm. In what form? Uh, in the idea that, you know, now internationally, you know, people have moved away from the Netanyahu model. Netanyahu hmm. model was to kind of ignore the Palestinian issue. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to resolve the problem. Um, uh, so uh, the, the issue is that um, the problem has to be resolved.
mm-hmm. Palestinian uh, issue. It's kind of the elephant in the room, let's say. Yeah. And it has to be uh, resolved. And then one, once it's resolved, you're, you're going to see a lot of improvement in the area. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the fact that it's back on the agenda, you know, President Biden uh, mentioning it several times, and now it's in, been in the news so many times, mm-hmm. that I think... Uh, it's going to have to be addressed in a more equitable fashion. But mm-hmm. first, the war has to stop. Uh, the issue with the hostages, now, I'm not a military expert, right? Uh, so, so I'm not sure what, you know, but, but I think that the problem is that Hamas operates militarily in a way of cells that are not connected to each other. Mm. Uh, this is partly by design and partly by circumstance. So it's very difficult for them to coordinate with each other while the bombs are, are dropping. Mm-hmm. So that has to stop so that they can see, you know, how many hostages are here, how many hostages are there. Mm-hmm. I'm not justifying what they're doing, but mm-hmm. I'm just explaining mm-hmm. that that could be part of the reason there's a delay mm-hmm. uh, uh, from their perspective. From the Israeli perspective, I think, you know, Netanyahu is... Uh, you know, he's trying to prolong this as much as possible because mm. he knows that once this is over, the Israeli public is going to get rid of him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people in Israel, from what I gather, are, are tired of Netanyahu. But, of course, in mm-hmm. a war, yeah, they're not going to get rid of him in the middle of a like, war. People voted for Bush again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So. Yeah. So in the middle of the war, no. But, but once the conflict is over, then, you know, mm-hmm. there'll be a reckoning because... You know, there were the fraud issues in the beginning, and then there was the issue of how he handled mm-hmm. this conflict. And I hear one of the biggest things on social media is if there was a ceasefire, because there was a ceasefire on October 6th, someone broke it, right? Hamas broke it. So if there was another ceasefire again, what would kind of guarantee that another break yes. doesn't happen? So Hamas does not view itself as only a Gaza group. Mm. Okay, we use itself as a national group. As a whole, yeah. And there was no ceasefire in, in the West Bank. I mean, Israel was killing people mm. you know, every, every other day almost. There were people getting killed. Uh, the policy that the Netanyahu government, I mean, this is a very rightist, uh, right-wing government, very yeah. extreme. So, you know, there's a, a, there was no ceasefire. I mean, the, the government was, was very aggressive. Uh, especially the last two years, things have been getting worse and worse. Mm-hmm. And then also, of course, there was the rapprochement, you know, not rapprochement, but kind of the normalization, uh, proposed normalization between Saudi and Israel. And so Palestinians felt that they were being forgotten. Mm. And so maybe that was also a motivation behind uh, mm-hmm. October 7. The ha- Hamas and the Palestinian side sees that there actually wasn't a ceasefire. So it's not like anyone broke it. But let's say, I mean, I hear if, if Israel was able to stop fighting and give back some land, make concessions, it would be over. From your perspective, would you say, do most Palestinians feel that way if there was some, you know, actually give this back and we stop, would there yeah. be a stop? Or would they continue to say, no, one state, because we hear from the river to the sea, yeah. right? So how do we argue? Um, uh, I think uh, there is a uh, desire Mm-hmm. Uh, among Palestinians to have normal lives. Mm. There is a deep desire. I think if the conditions are, are better mm-hmm. and if they they see a political horizon in the offing, you know, mm-hmm. then uh, my, my, my hope uh, and, and my estimation is that yes, it will, it will get there. Okay. But it has to be, you know, there has to be like a 180 degree turn mm-hmm. in how things are going. Mm-hmm. And uh, right now, that doesn't look like it. But mm-hmm. you never know. You know, things can change rapidly. Mm-hmm. As we saw, things have changed to the worse very quickly. Mm-hmm. But they can also change to the better. Very this quickly. too shall change. Yeah, right? yeah exactly, so. exactly. So. And I guess, do you see a, a predicament where if that did happen, but violence continued because from the river to the sea, what spot does that leave in Israel for the Israelis? Would so, that be another justification to just keep going? So from the river to the sea, you know, it has multiple meanings, as I'm sure you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there are Palestinians from the river to the sea. That's the historic homeland. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, if Palestinians are emancipated from the river to the sea, 
and they're free, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to like throw the Israelis into the sea. Yeah. You know. That. Even though, so, but I, I feel we should be clear. We do hear that though in a lot of these protests and online. It, fuck them, throw them in the sea. No, but we're hoping that the middle portion of both sides will be able to have this calm agreement, talk common, conversation, and just yeah. say. No, no, no. We nobody wants that. And if you do, screw you. You're part yeah, there, of the problem. There has to be a very clear yeah. consensus, uh, very clearly made on what is uh, mm -hmm. what is uh, some common ground for both peoples. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. then just to answer you further, mm -hmm. you know, to to answer the second part of your question, is uh, if there is a ceasefire, if there is a stop, what would guarantee that it wouldn't happen again? Mm -hmm. I think the more progress that's made toward the political horizon, the more likely that uh, the violence will decrease. Say, and the less likely people will be able to see kids growing up now a reason to be mad. Yes, There will exactly. be less reasons to be mad. Exactly. And I think, you know, with Hamas, Hamas will have to transform. Mm -hmm. And this is not unheard of, you know, like, for example, we mentioned Ireland earlier, mm -hmm. how the IRA and Sinn Féin, I mean, Sinn Féin is the political party and IRA is the military wing, and then they mm -hmm. gave up on that, or largely gave up on it. Mm -hmm. So it is possible, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the Hamas leaders have talked about, like, a long-term hudna or ceasefire of 100 years. Mm. Uh, then there are those who have signaled, you know, uh, willingness to accept a two-state solution mm -hmm. among among Hamas people. I'm saying. Okay. And then you know the Palestinians will have to form like a unity government. They mm. have to have a, like a, maybe a, a vote of some kind mm -hmm. to to show, you know, what are the things that they are looking for, mm -hmm. and then negotiate. The problem with the negotiations, though, is that if the U.S. is the you know, intermediary or the, the supervisor of the negotiations, that is unfair because, mm. you know, in the U.S., Israel has a lot of support, you know. So it's almost like there would need to be two mediators. Yeah. Maybe like a, I guess, Jordan, Egypt. Yeah, maybe something like that. Lebanon. I mean, they tried with the quartet, remember, which was the U.N., mm -hmm. uh, U.S., Russia, and... Uh, Probably China. No. No. Uh, uh, U.S., Russia, U.N., and EU. Oh, okay. So that was the quartet. Mm -hmm. But that failed because really it was the U.S. calling the shots. Yeah. You know, and the U.S., because of, uh, you know, Israel's influence in, in, in the U.S., um, mm -hmm. it's difficult to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, some people will exaggerate this influence and that, that gets into, like, anti-Semitism and all that, which, of course, I deplore. Mm -hmm. But but Israel does have a lot of influence in the U.S. I think that's that's obvious. Mm -hmm. But the Palestinians now, you know, they also have support here. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe not everywhere, but you see that uh, with young people, with the black people, with Muslims, with etc. They have pockets of support in the U.S. Yeah, and it seems like the support for a Palestinian national movement here is a lot of times confused with pro-violence and just, uh, fuck it, you guys think they did bad things to you? You want to be violent? Okay, we support you. So what would be a message for people on social media who want, who think, oh, go be violent because it's your land? No, What's of, course, of course not. I mean, uh, it has to be a principled movement. Mm -hmm. uh, Nonviolence has to be like, uh, uh, not negotiable, you know, the non violence has to be the number one mm -hmm. principle there. If it's violent, it's apolitical. As yeah. soon as you become violent, it's not politics anymore. It's yeah. violence, it's war. You yeah. can't have, yeah. it's one or the other. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a problem. I mean, you know, people will say that uh, um, people seeking uh, a national liberation um, Mm -hmm. You know that people people under occupation seeking national liberation have a right to to fight mm -hmm. uh, but you know even within that framework there's there are ways to fight that are legitimate and ways to fight that are illegal and that's where 
a lot of people criticize Hamas because yes, it's like you're not that. fighting in a uniform, yeah. human shields, fucking rockets in buildings, in fucking yeah. school. What are you doing? So, yeah. but you know, of course, the response to that, not mm. to defend Hamas, yeah. but the response to that is well, they are deprived of a state, mm. and so they cannot fight in a conventional way. Because if they did, they would not stand a chance, mm -hmm. you know. But if they were given a state and an army, then it would be like more, more equal. But mm. it, 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 it's irrelevant. It's yeah. not, not, you know, you could, people could look for justification all day long. My opinion is that nonviolence should be number one, mm -hmm. non-negotiable. And uh, if it were me, uh, all the militant factions should be disarmed. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it should be a non-violent movement that incorporates allies from, uh, from uh, you know, Palestinians with allies from all over the world, from Israel it's itself. Now it looks a little bit hard because, you know, the Israeli public has moved to the right. Mm -hmm. But there was a time after the first Intifada when there was a lot of left-wing uh, sentiment in Israel. A lot of people wanted to, to help. Mm -hmm. uh, the Palestinians. So, I mean, I can't imagine that none of those people are still around. And, you know, their their children, some of them may have those feelings yeah. if, if the space is created for yeah. that. So what could, it, what could be a compromise or some shared goal, some shared value, something that can be prompted to help unify a Palestinian and an Israeli? What, what's some, what is that? Well... <laughs> I think when th this war is over, mm -hmm. uh, there is a huge humanitarian need, okay? And certainly yeah. the Israelis can, can help with that. Uh, and I'd imagine it would probably be best, because America went in and helped rebuild Germany and Japan. Right. So Israel could uh, rebuild uh, Gaza. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, um, uh, joint uh, medical clinics, joint uh, schooling, uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe expeditions, joint, uh, uh, a lot of joint projects, economic yeah. empowerment. Also, a lot of Palestinians, once the war is over, they're going to need to work. Mm. And so they're going to need to be able to cross yeah, they, the line. They have to, like, lessen those things. And from the Israeli side, there is a responsibility, in my opinion, to elect more reasonable yeah. po political figures. Uh, but mm -hmm. the problem is this goes to a problem in Israel itself, which I, I'm sure you know from, from you know the people that you do know in Israel that uh, Israeli society is divided mm -hmm. between those who want a more secular, moderate state and those who want a more theo theocratic state. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to go by the theocratic mode, there will be no coexistence. I mean, it will be very yeah. hard because... You can't... Yeah, literally. My yeah. sister, she's like, ah, oh, I can't get married if I'm not Jewish here. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, what? so there's a, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things internally that Israel needs to figure out. Mm -hmm. And the Palestinians also, as I said, you know, there needs to be a new election. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it would help if Israel releases somebody like Barghouti. Uh, mm. Uh, who could, uh, uh, Marwan Barghouti, who could probably win an election even against a Hamas candidate. Is he, a, uh, would he be more of a, a mediator? Or a, well, a mediator? he's, you know, I don't agree with all of, of things he, he, he says or, or the things he did, but he would be a candidate that could win votes from, Fat I mean, he's a Fatah person. Which Fatah is? Vote. Uh, you know the the, the secular party, mm -hmm. and he could win. Uh, he could defeat Hamas in an election also. So that's one possible figure. Mm -hmm. um, there's also Mustafa Barghouti, same family, but they're distantly related, mm -hmm. who is more into non-violence. Mm. So Marwan Barghouti is more militant than Mustafa Barghouti. But both of those guys, I think, if they if they're allowed more more space, they could mm. actually you know uh, create something. Uh, uh, on the Palestinian side, some momentum that's away from Hamas. Maybe. Yeah, so it seems like there's a complete lack of trust on both sides, and that's yeah. a requirement for cooperation and peace, is some form of trust that we, we're we going to keep this state, we're going to actually not fight each other. And yeah. How do you feel like trust can be gained back? How can people start to trust? Yeah, trust has been broken both between the two communities and within both communities. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, so that's uh, it's going to take time. But again, you know, we have seen cases internationally. Of course, as I said, each case has its own context. Yeah. Where that has happened, like rebuilding trust between Catholic and Protestant communities in Ireland, mm -hmm. rebuilding trust between you know the white Afrikaner community and the blacks in South Africa, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, rebuilding trust, you know, in many other war zones, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the former Yugoslavia and all the different states get along mm -hmm. pretty well and things have improved a lot there. So they, they can be uh, trust, but it's going to take excellent leadership. Mm -hmm. Number one, very good leaders on both sides. A lot of international help, a lot of joint mm -hmm. programs and projects, as I said. Um, uh, yeah, but oh. for the people who lost uh, family, It'll be hard to repair those wounds, you know. Some of those wounds cannot be repaired. And this is why I think ceasefire needs to happen because, you know, I mean, I imagine from the Israeli perspective, one of the things that uh, Israelis are maybe not understanding is that the more this goes on, the less chance there is for reconciliation mm -hmm. because some of the damage that's being done is of a... A long-lasting nature, mm -hmm. you know. The, I understand that they want to make sure that Hamas is not able to inflict something like that again. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, by causing this extensive uh, human tragedy, you know, that's making them in the long term less secure. Mm -hmm. In the short term, yes, it improves their security. But in the long term, I don't think so. Yeah. The idea of peace traced back to the French, to the as far back as you want to trace it, comes from an idea of to join, to fasten, to come yeah. together. Yeah. And if it's like a broken chair, like if you can't put the pieces back together, you can't yeah. have it. It's not functional. Yeah. So yeah. what are the peace talks, and how could it actually come to a result? Because I feel like you know we're sitting in a chair here and yeah, Oakland, we're comfortable. We're yeah. comfortable, but for yeah. the people that are, you know, in it, who are still in that emotional state because we're, we're chill we had yeah. some coffee yeah, drinking exactly. water yeah both the people who are right now emotional in that do or die fight or flight mm -hmm. anger sat the, how, how do they come out of it yeah yeah you know i mean one thing is uh, uh i mean i don't know but yeah. i think the human being's capacity to adapt uh is is pretty uh, mm -hmm. substantial i think once the war is over then, uh, then you know, things could, could change, could improve. I mean, you mentioned Germany and Japan. Mm -hmm. You know, those communities after the war, they recovered pretty fast. Uh, they, were, they became, in fact, allies yeah. to the United States. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, that was, I mean, 45, 1945. Uh, the amount of destruction in Japan and Germany was, was significant. Crazy. And Holy then shit. very quickly... You know, in a 10-year period, there was a, uh, you know, pretty uh, impressive recovery. Mm -hmm. And, of course, by the 19, 1980s, Japan became a huge powerhouse. Germany as well, of course. Freaking crazy. They're leading yeah. the EU. Yeah. So, yeah. so it could happen. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying Gaza and the West Bank are Germany uh, or <laughs> Japan. <laughs> yeah. But, but I'm saying that there is a lot of potential there if, mm -hmm. you know, if the right things happen. Is there a step-by-step -step thing that you've been thinking of personally of if, if we were able to do these few things, there would be resolve? Or how, how would forgiveness, because also <laughs> reconciliation to mend friendships, it requires forgiveness. How do we start that? How were you and your family able to forgive or were you able to forgive the Israeli army for taking yeah. your guys' home? How? Yeah, well, you know, with, the, with us, it's... Uh my family has always been, uh, you know, of a moderate inclination, and they all, they've always wanted just this thing to, to end, but to end equitably. And, mm -hmm. um, but I think, like, in more, uh, in cases where people have lost more than just the home, mm -hmm. uh, then you're going to have to have something like, you know, what South Africa did, which is like a truth and reconciliation committee, mm. uh, in which uh, they... Uh, they brought uh, people who, who uh, on both sides, who made, uh, who did wrong. Yeah. And they had them and their victims, you know. Talk, uh, talk apologize, and yeah. say what they went through. And yeah, yeah, so something like that. But we're talking long, long term. 
-hmm. I mean, right now, as you know from social media, people <laughs> are, you know, if, if, if people are not on that uh, wavelength at all. Not at all, yeah. yeah. Okay. And how do you see people, is there any help for the social media problem? Because it feels like, yeah, there's the problem, the actual problem, and then a social media problem of the, the narratives and people yeah, yeah. fighting about well, it. The one, you know, good thing about social media is that it has um, made the play, uh, it has, what's the expression, made the playground more equal? You know? Level the playing uh, field. Yes, uh, level the playing field, yeah. sorry. <laughs> you know, sometimes the fact that English is, even though I've been here forever, but yeah. sometimes, you know, I get reminded that English is my second language and, <laughs> and moments when I'm, you know, talking, I'll, I'll forget. Yeah, leveling the playing field, uh, social media did that in the mm -hmm. sense that, you know, the Palestinians did not have as much of a voice as the Israelis. The Israelis mm -hmm. were better represented in the mainstream papers and media. Mm -hmm. uh, even today, this continues to be the case. But social media leveled that mm -hmm. uh, playing field in the sense that the Palestinians were represented and, you know, on videos and, and so on. Mm -hmm. That's the, the good side because you want both narratives to be understood. If you only understand one narrative, it's not possible to be a helpful mediator. Yeah. Uh, so, but the bad side of that is that it also leads to, uh, you know, people preaching to the choir, people kind of existing in this echo chamber. Yeah. And you know how social media is. If you click on something that, you know, supports your point of view, once you click on it, you're going to get more videos or more links that are uh, with, yeah. you know, that speak to that same point of view. And you, you're already emotionally compelled to this point of view. You're less likely to question. You might see something that's straight up a lie, but like, no, I, this is true. Yeah. And then same thing with the other perspective. You get in your own eco chamber and you're like, yeah. There's never been any violence. Yeah. No one ever took any homes. It's like, well, yes, yes, yes. You, so, you got yours. <laughs> yeah. So, so then it becomes, yeah, exactly. It becomes more polarizing. Yeah. And I think also that because you don't see the other person, mm. but right now you and I are speaking together. And, yeah. And when you speak to somebody in front of you, um, you know, it, it is conducive to conversation. Whereas if it's online, it's very easy to kind of be harsh in your words. Oh my gosh, yeah. And to start <laughs> attacking somebody because you don't see them. Yeah. And some of the stuff, they start attacking each other. It becomes very personal. Yeah. And they're very nasty. Yep. And, and you have to remember there's another human being there who has all sorts of ideas and, you know, has all sorts of emotions, has their own, uh, you know, you can't insult somebody like that. <laughs> yeah. That's why I try to avoid that stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's not, not very helpful. Though. Let's just give a rundown to see if you think what I talk about in my book is yeah. hold some kind of truth. Yeah. For there to be cooperation, yeah. both sides need to say that the other side does have some value and has some truth to what they think. You have to be able to take their perspective. So not just hear their side, but really feel it, get out of that emotional state, and then talk. Try to find anything that could be of similarity, anything, music, yeah. maybe you guys yeah. both like soccer. You know, you're playing soccer in Gaza, you're playing soccer in Israel, anything. That's the basics. Right. Recognize legitimacy, try to find similarity, take perspective. How yeah, uh, the problem is that, you know, the conflict has become so, like, uh, polarized and so hurtful mm. is that even on those things in which they might, people might get along, mm -hmm. it starts into that, uh, it gets into that, uh, that mood. For mm. example, you know, the whole issue of food, mm. you know, that the Israelis, you know, like falafel, and it's like one of the national <laughs> dishes of Israel, and then the Arabs say, well, you stole that from us, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So then we even get into that. Uh, so that's not really uh, helpful. I think uh, once the conditions for coexistence are set, you know, once there's, you know, no more occupation, then those things you talked about are much more doable. Mm -hmm. But I think first, you need to have that because it's very hard, you know, somebody who sees, uh, you know, has to go through checkpoints and sees an army there and, you know, is insulted by the soldiers, so on and so forth. And you tell them, oh, go have lunch with an Israeli and go have a good time. 
Yeah. It's uh, it's hard. It's easy for me to tell mm -hmm. them that because I don't live under those conditions. Yeah. Know? So what I talked about in my book, yeah, because I, I kind of make it clear, this is what needs to happen before there's violence. Because if yeah. this doesn't happen, there will 100% be violence. But if there's already violence, what are the prerequisites to stopping the violence? What has to be done to stop it? Like we said, just mediaries. I mean, I feel like we might be saying the same thing over and over again because yeah, it's such I, a- I mean, I think there has to be maybe in tandem a political process that you know removes the occupation mm -hmm. and uh, and also at the same time uh, gives guarantees you know so so removing the occupation would help the palestinians mm -hmm. but also you know should be accompanied by a process where you know the israelis feel that hamas is, is not going to be able to, is not going to do this again so it seems like the comprom what, uh, what israelis need is Security that you guys aren't just gonna come in and start stabbing, bombing, raping, whatever that. But then the Palestinians are gonna say, "Yeah, same thing." Yeah, right? Yeah. So, so the violence has to uh, stop on both sides. Mm -hmm. Even though, of course, you know, people, Palestinians don't like it when we say, when when people say both sides mm. because it's asymmetrical. You know, there's a lot more violence directed at Palestinians than the other way around. Mm. Um, but. It doesn't matter almost if you look at it from the perspective of the Israelis, because even a little bit of violence is still, for them, a lot of violence, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so, so one person dead is too many people dead. Mm -hmm. uh, same with the Palestinian side. So yes, stopping the violence, I agree. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the political process, maybe in tandem with social process of the kind that we talked mm -hmm. about, the uh, meetings, the clinics, the joint mm -hmm. efforts. And so if we want to be less optimistic and try to think what could be the future if there isn't a ceasefire and if like what's the worst case scenario right now? Oof. Oh, there's many bad scenarios. One scenario is that um, there's a complete, uh, you know, the genocide or eradication of the population of Gaza mm -hmm. uh, or expulsion. That's one, ba one, you know, doomsday scenario. Another would be, um, you know, the, f uh, the war between Israel and Hezbollah. Mm. You know, right now, it's a very low-level conflict. But there are, what, like 100,000 people? Hamas is only like 20 or something? Yeah, and, uh, and not only that, Hezbollah is much more militarily skilled, has much more um, uh, devastating uh, weaponry. Mm -hmm. um, not cornered on all sides. Mm -hmm. A very different situation would be much more devastating, uh, you know, for both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, so if uh, so, that's another scenario that this thing uh, becomes a regional conflict. Uh, I, you know, already it's a regional conflict, yeah, some ways, yeah. but a bigger regional conflict. So that would be a doomsday scenario, mm -hmm. and then that in the West Bank. You know, already West Bank now. There's a lot of things going on that it uh, it, it gets worse. Mm. So so that's uh, that's the doomsday scenario, and that's why this thing has to stop. And I think now the problem is because it's an election year. Mm. Kind of Biden has his hands tied almost. I mean, he's trying to stop it, but at the same time, not you know, exerting enough pressure. Mm -hmm. um, because he's afraid that this would be a boon for the Republicans if he did that. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, you know, his policies uh, will cost him in the election in the sense that a lot of Arabs and Muslims mm -hmm. and maybe young progressives won't vote for him. Are you able to vote? Yeah. Okay. I, I voted for Biden last time. Okay. Uh, what do you think this year? <laughs> this time, well, you know, I've... I've argued about this with, with people. Uh, my opinion is that, uh, you know, the, unfortunately on like Israel, Palestine, both parties are, are pretty bad. Yeah. But the Democrats, I think, are better than the Republicans on this regard. Because the Republicans side more with the idea of just, fuck it, no ceasefire. But you feel like the Democrats say, no, no, no. We do need to say Yeah, that. and also the, the, exactly, and the base of the Democratic Party is changing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe not, you don't see it immediately uh, uh, in terms of, you know, the level of international policy and national policy, but slowly 
-hmm. think the Democratic Party is changing and moving more to the left. And so for me, uh, obviously, Biden is a much um, better candidate than Trump mm -hmm. uh, for both the Middle East and for the U.S. Mm. But, uh, I guess what would your opinion on the Abraham Accords? Because I hear people. I think, uh, you know, they were problematic because, you know, they... Uh, it's kind of, as I said before, you know, like kind of tackling everything but the elephant in the room, like the mm. biggest problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Netanyahu has always been of the mindset that, you know, he doesn't want a Palestinian state, he doesn't want to give a lot to the Palestinians, he uh, is very ideological in that sense, and uh, he thinks he can bypass the Palestinian mm. issue, and I don't, I don't think so. I think that's a, that's a core issue in that region. Mm -hmm. If it's resolved, you know, there's, I mean, I can't tell Saudis and Emiratis and <laughs> Qataris and whoever, but the Qataris actually haven't signed. Yeah. And the Saudis haven't yet, but, but that was in process. But I can't tell people, you know, other Arabs what to do as a Jordanian. We have a peace treaty with Israel, but mm -hmm. our peace treaty came after the PLO, Israel, uh, Oslo uh, Accords, mm -hmm. after the Declaration of Principles was signed in D.C., then the Jordanians said, okay, we'll, we'll have a peace treaty. So I think eventually, you know, if there's a Palestinian state and if things are good, then Israel should be, you know, part of the region. Mm -hmm. If not, no. If, if, you know, if it's just like uh, uh, oppressing all these people, there's an apartheid situation. No, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, the Arab states, not that it shouldn't be part of the region, but that the Arab states should be wary. Mm. Well, of the Israelis, you know, but I can't tell them what to do, you know. I mean, I think eventually, hopefully, there will be peace between Israel and Palestine and with the broader Arab world. Are people often surprised by you because you you say, oh, I'm a Jordanian Palestinian? Are, they peop are people always assuming that you're a Muslim that supports violence and like, hoorah, Palestine, screw Jews? Like, do you, do you get that impression from people? Um, or do you give up? Uh, you know, uh, there's many different misconceptions about people from the Middle East, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes uh, people are surprised uh, that there are, uh, you know, uh, Christians in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, then people don't understand also that with Muslims, there's a wide variety of opinion, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and with Arabs as well, and so there's a lot of, like, misconceptions, and yeah, you get it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the worst thing you've been called? Like, are people... Oh. I haven't, no, I haven't been called bad names that much, no. Okay. But there are certain misconceptions you, you hear, you know. Uh, hmm. What's the biggest? Uh, like, for example, oh, I didn't know there were Christians in Jordan. <laughs> I heard that a few times, well, you know, but, but sometimes with that, I'm surprised because... You know, people, they don't know about the baptism of Jesus and the Jordan River. Yeah. Or, so it's kind of like a disconnect. <laughs> people assume Christianity is a Western religion. Uh, yeah, it's like, yeah. what? Yeah, <laughs> what it was in his founding, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one misconception. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes people don't understand that, uh, you know, the Middle East, there's a lot of people live in, in cities, mostly not in the desert. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's a little bit of that, the camels and the desert. And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, for example, I play tennis at a competitive level. Oh, shit. And so then people are surprised. Oh, you have tennis in Jordan? Yeah, we, we have. <laughs> so it's not like, you know, they, we just live in tents there and there's nothing going on. But so you get some of that a little bit sometimes, okay. yeah. Well, I feel like we've talked about pretty much everything. Yeah, me like, too. Yeah. I don't want to keep circling back into yeah. how could we fix it because we've said the same thing. Yeah, like, we, yeah. It's uh, it's hard. I mean, some yeah. of it is is beyond. I mean, some of this, this is why this is a difficult uh, mm -hmm. question to to resolve. Perfect. Well, All thank right. you for taking thank the time you. with thank me. I Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and slide on over to Amazon and check out my book, Behaving as Us. Add it to your cart read it, and once you do, drop a review so it can help the Amazon algorithms too. All right, y'all. Peace.